I'm Jennifer Walinga, professor of school in the School of Communication and Culture at World Roads University, and welcome to this special episode 29 of the Sport Leadership and Social Change webinar series. This is part of a, a suite of episodes that we pull together under the umbrella topic of culture and born of the Culture Collaborative, a community of practice of practitioners and researchers and, and leaders in the sport system across Canada. Uh, we all have an interest in helping sport organizations develop uh, their culture, their strategic planning, their team dynamics, their communication systems and structures. This episode is based on a, a talk I was giving in both Calgary and Edmonton recently to our alums and our prospects, colleagues, friends um, across Alberta about the Olympic principles that can guide organizational success. And so I'm drawing on my personal and professional experience as both a former athlete, but also as a researcher and consultant in the realm of organizational development, and lately being called to work in the sport system more and more. So drawing on the metaphor of sport, talking about how that parallels with organizational principles and structures and concepts, and then also pointing to some of the research and inquiry we've been doing into the Canadian sports system lately that's really facing some serious challenges. So the idea that we can learn from the best of experiences, just like in sport, when you have a, a success, a win, a, a PB, you learn a lot from that optimal performance. But you also learn so much when you face challenges or failures, and it's important to learn from both perspectives. We spent some time both in Calgary and in Edmonton, and uh, of course, we always acknowledge the unceded territories we're on. And even though we're not directly responsible for inflicting harms over the past uh, centuries, we are. We do bear that responsibility now to acknowledge the truth and work toward healing and reconciliation. And healing has been a topic for our culture collaborative lately. Uh, the, the importance that. Every time something goes uh, awry, or abuse occurs within our sport system, the costs are huge. Financially, of course, we're seeing with the Hockey Canada case, for instance, the amount of money spent, uh, misspent on uh, some very serious allegations and settlements. But we're also seeing the human costs. And recently, I was seeing on Twitter today that the idea that a victim of abuse can really or, uh, face a life sentence, you know, and that they're they're traumatized, they're going to have to deal with that trauma uh, for the rest of their life. And of course, we all face trauma at different times in our lives, but um, something that threatens your passion, your love for the sport so deeply can have uh, very deleterious effects, long-term implications and, and huge human costs. And not just for the victim, but you think of the community surrounding the case and the impact that's having. And I would say our country right now is really suffering from some of these cases as well. We're all on a journey and uh, I'll reference the path that I've gone down as an athlete researcher and professional uh, and consultant in the space. And of course I was sharing the, the campus with our alums and reminding them of what a beautiful place it is and, and how we operate and the perspective we gain here by looking out over the one if you could straight to the Olympic mountains. I was also taunting them a little bit about that summer and then this is, this is winter. The only difference of course being uh, the snowy tops of those mountains. I always wanna highlight the importance of the bridge and also our campus that it really underpins a lot of the work that I do. And I think it's very relevant to the work we're doing in sport as well, that diversity is so, so crucial. Uh, it's staring us in the face on our campus every day and that it's always reminding us how important, uh, how our very survival really and the survival, the, the endurance of our environment hinges on diversity. But as learners within um, an academic setting, and we are all learning, right? We're very learning centered at Royal Roads. We must really appreciate our unique differences in order to learn. Just like in sport, two teams are challenging one another. That's how we get better. We actually push each other up or toward our optimal performances. So it's quite a collaborative endeavor, actually. People often think that competition is destructive, but it's incredibly collaborative, just like the idea of building a bridge and acknowledging the two sides before you extend that structure. 
Uh, Royal Rose, I also think our learning, teaching and research model is very relevant to the work I do in sport and that much of these principles or concepts of um, wanting to be applied and take our learning and then apply it in, in, in our performances. So we practice, 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 and then try to apply, right? Get challenged uh, to implement our new knowledge and, and theory. We can only do that in a very caring and community-based environment. That's, those are the tenets of psychological safety that you first must feel safe to be unique, be your unique self, and you're safe to be part of that group. You're welcomed and we definitely welcome everybody and all that they bring, all the learning that they bring. In fact, we kind of demand it because the learning community can only function when everybody's bringing their own experiences and knowledge. Um, but you need to then feel also safe to contribute what you know, safe then to learn and make mistakes, try things and experiment. And ultimately, when you're able to do all of those things, you feel much more confident to challenge the greater system. And, and I often, when I led the MA program in our school for years, uh, the first exercise we would do is asking them to challenge our cultural integrity at Royal Roads and point out, yes, where we're living our values, but where where does it look like we're incongruent and our practice isn't quite matching or is contradicting what we say we value? That's one of the first exercises I have my students do because it's important that they understand right away we are inviting them to challenge the system, the campus, the way we do things, the program. And uh, same goes for sport, of course. We need our athletes and coaches and officials and any participants in sport to feel safe enough to actually question, challenge, look for better ways, um, try to better understand, but we're always trying to learn and get better. And if it's not safe to do that, well, we simply won't get better. And we're seeing that right now with the sports system in our country, but also globally, I would say. So the idea that in order to implement well, we need a caring community-based safe environment uh, in order to actually learn, foster transformation in others starts with experiencing transformation in oneself. And so today, speaking about sport and, you know, many people wonder, well, what is the relationship between sport and Royal Rose? We don't have any sports teams necessarily, you know, we don't have them, we have a peacock, but they're not a sports team mascot in any way. Uh, I was joking that we do have cougars on the campus, so we could be the RRU cougars and there are lots of 50 year old women wandering around because we're for mid-career professionals for the most part, you'll see a lot of uh, middle-aged people, students coming back to get their master's or their doctorates. But no, we don't have a sports team. It's a very active campus. There are tons of trails and amazing intramurals and a wonderful gym, but we uh, don't necessarily have the RAU Cougars. However, we do tackle overarching topics like climate and globalization or technology. And so sport is another one of those concepts that are engage, I would say, probably engage the world more completely than any other uh, in human endeavor. It's the most watched, it's the most participated in, probably the most loved and hated human endeavor in the world. And so sport is really worth our attention because it also is a laboratory for learning and often a microcosm reflecting some of the things going on in our society. And we see that right now. We also know that sport is a wonderful agent for change. It has great power and platform because of its reach and impact. And so I'm always so proud of seeing sport participants, whether they're athletes or coaches or leaders of any kind, using that platform of sport, that reach to really enact change, to pursue inclusion and greater equity, uh, access and peace. In that light, we as a university often partner with industry, of course, because of that relationship with practice. We are as uh, academics, I'm a professor, but I'm also a consultant. I'm encouraged to keep my hand in with uh, the work that I do working with organizations because then I'm current, but I also have cases I can bring back to my classroom, right? And share with the students that are real. We invite organizations into our classroom as well, of course, you know, with their with their real time uh, challenges, organizational challenges, whether it's leadership or financial or um, in terms of team dynamics or communication, technology, whatever you're facing, we invite you in to share the challenges and our students then work on those, not in a kind of a case 
competition kind of way, but in a way that we are all, we all have this live case we can work on together and share our solutions and insights and in, in working it through and then present back to the organization. We also partner with organizations like the CFL Players Association and teach, you know, leadership courses or workshops. So many opportunities at Royal Rose, of all sorts of kinds of learning and uh, learning opportunities. We also, as part of our flexible admission policy, we acknowledge professional experience that includes athletic. So uh, athletes who competed at the international level, they are welcome to come into our programs and we will give them credit for those years spent representing Canada. It's a nice way to uh, come back into learning uh, once you're out of your athletic career and actually realize that that 10 years you spent on the national team was an education as well, just like being a manager within uh, Alberta Health Service or something like that, right? You've learned so much. So of course we translate that. And then you can, even if you don't have a full BA, we can add on some credits from your professional experience and you're ready to, to enter into an MA, especially as a more mature student. That can be very helpful. And so this was also born of that thinking that we partner with these organizations. I have a particular interest in research as do many of our students. And uh, I often supervise projects in, at the graduate and doctoral level that have to do with sport in some way. And so this is really informing the webinar series we've pulled together called Sport Leadership and Social Change. And as a change maker university, it's really important to us that we uh, are always looking for ways to foster and facilitate positive social change across our world, not just Canada. And I want to invite people to the next webinar, which will be coming up on the 21st of February. It's a Wednesday, 12 to 1.30, kind of our typical slot, so live. And you're invited to come on in and watch uh, and participate as well. We often invite questions or even, you know, turn your mic on and, and have a little chat with our guests. We have four fabulous guests joining us. And this, um, this one episode will be part of a larger conference, two-day conference called the Communication Ethics Conference that we put on annually. And you'll usually have about a thousand people register for this conference. It's free, it's online fully, but a whole slew of other episodes and um, workshops that'll be available as well. But we welcome our four scholars from across Canada. We've got Western University in Ottawa and uh, Ontario Tech and also St. Thomas from New Brunswick represented here as well as myself from the West at Royal Roads, all interested in culture and sport and how to rebuild that integrity across our system kind of research perspectives are these uh, fabulous scholars going to offer. So today I'll talk a bit more about uh, the work that we've done around Olympic principles or sport principles that can that can lend themselves or inform organizational leadership. I'll also reference the work that we're doing in studying some of the cases unfolding across our system right now, because we know there is truth in sport. It is an education. There are core principles. The, this little boat I row every day backwards teaches me something daily. Uh, today, it was really about how if you want to uh, increase, your, increase your pace, you really need to practice, right? You need to actually get used to the pace before you can start to operate at that pace. And I was reminded of that today. I was trying to increase my rate, my rhythm and rate in the boat. And it was feeling quite sluggish. And I thought, oh, right, I have to kind of overrate and practice that a little bit. So it's, I'm accustomed to it. And then I can come back and settle into something that feels a little more comfortable. Uh, we have to practice everything. And even as, as leaders in our organizations, practice is very relevant as well. So you want to improve something like your communication style or your relationships. It actually takes intentional effort and practice. And sometimes we have to overdo it in order to find a, a kind of pace that is more manageable or sustainable. Challenge ourselves is the key. And so I'll start with a story that I think really embodies a lot of the principles that I'll share for the rest of the, web, the webinar episode. And it is, stories of course are always so powerful, but it is just so, such a seminal experience and uh, something that I think lays the real foundation for these six principles that I'll go into more detail on as we as we go here. It starts my first Olympics, 1988, in uh, Seoul, Korea. It wasn't quite what I expected. Uh, rather disappointing, I would say, in that um, you know you're you're a, I think I was 20 
I would have been 23 years old. I'd been on the team for several years, but this was my first Olympics because I think it came on just a, in 1984. So I watched these other colleagues of mine do really well, and but it was a boycotted Olympics. So a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries didn't attend. Um, so a little easier to win perhaps uh, because we weren't facing this. If this is the medal table for the women's rowing events at the 88 Olympics, and you'll see that it was fairly dominated by the Eastern Bloc countries. So this is East Germany, almost a clean sweep, although I often say not clean though, however, very unclean in that they were definitely using performance enhancing drugs and we know that to be true, of course, now. Now, unfortunately, then Romania follows, we see uh, China and Russia and Bulgaria. So all of these countries are Eastern Bloc countries. We know now and we knew we had suspicions then that they were doping at the time. Uh, we had two outliers, uh, the New Zealand pair of Lindley Hannon and her partner and Anne Martin, the single from the U.S. snuck in for these, a silver and a bronze medal. But otherwise, it was just dominated and very, very uh, disheartening for athletes trying to break on to that podium, feeling rather hopeless. And there was just so much cheating and corruption going on. It felt like um, it really took the wind out of everyone's sails. Now, you'll also recall that this was the Olympics where Ben Johnson, our star sprinter at the time, had won the gold and then had it stripped because he was caught doping as well. So in many ways, Canada was the scapegoat, ironically, for doping in the world. And I was really proud it was us because I know we did a really good job. We had the Dublin Inquiry and it led to some fantastic policies and procedures. Um, it led to a doping association. We have a Canadian Center for Ethics and Sport that's really well renowned and doing great work. The true sport movement, you know, it led to a lot of really positive things in sport. And I think in only the way that Canada can do with humility and pushing up our sleeves and getting to work and making things better and learning. Now we're facing a similar crisis in Canada. We've actually won the Ig Nobel Sport Award for the amount of abuse allegations that we're experiencing right now and we've done something where we've tipped over the edge and really become uh lost our way i think in sport and our sport system is really suffering for it the uh, so many people within the sport system are suffering for it and and we think it's because of this crisis of integrity and culturally culture is values and beliefs and our values and beliefs are are off the path we need to get them back on to what we truly believe in in canada and I think um, the incongruity occurred when we started to confuse or misconstrue what was most important. And of course, medals are not the most important thing. And that was a key learning in 1988, that it wasn't really about the gold medal, it was about other things. But you can see how incredibly dis disappointed we were. Um, it just felt like hopeless. And like any good crisis, um, it brings into focus, into stark relief, what is most important. It literally puts you through an existential crisis where you're questioning, why are we here? What are we doing? You know, it's goofy enough that we're going backwards in a boat. Um, however, I always, I always mediate that with the concept that no matter what we're doing, whether you're crocheting or playing violin or dancing or going backwards in a boat, when you're striving for excellence, it is a worthwhile endeavor. And that's really what we were doing is striving for excellence and any, you know, activity can be just so beautiful and elegant. Rowing definitely is one of those things. So we knew it was about striving for excellence. That was very much brought into focus for us. And we did love, we love this sport. I fell in love with it when I was a kid and never really looked back. It was my first love, my first true love, really. And so there's that passion and joy in the sport there was the striving for excellence and perfection the beauty of it right and the idea that we're striving to go as fast as we possibly can so the bar had been raised artificially through doping cheating performance enhancing drugs and we knew we didn't want to partake in that but we knew we also really felt a duty to sport to demonstrate to the world that it's still possible to win, to be the fastest without cheating. It felt like a real call to action. And so we set to work. And over the next four years in planning for the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, 
we did some deep thinking and creative problem solving and devised a new strategy in order to in order to ascend to the highest the fastest the strongest without compromising our ethics by using drugs and so the six principles uh, the first one is this idea of eyes in your own boat it's a favorite of my students it's applicable to your professional life your personal life community uh, involvements it's so important to keep your eyes in your own boat yes survey the environment identify what the challenges are within that environment like doping uh, look at you know who's going fast what's working out there in the world just like we do when we're preparing for a research study and then it's eyes in your own boat. You devise your own strategy that suits and reflects your strengths. So strengths-based and focus. Once, if you if you develop a plan that people have conviction and uh, in, then they will commit to it and you will have confidence and you will have success for sure. Focus is a very powerful and necessary tool to performance. And we'll talk more about that as we go. We knew we needed to win well, not at all costs. We wanted to win with um, uh, uh, with morality, right? <laughs> Doing it the right way. But we also knew we wanted to win well in that we wanted to be healthy and intact. And of course, <clears throat> um, taking performance enhancing drugs is really a threat to your health. Uh, it causes all sorts of complications later in life. So healthy but also well in terms of personally intact, psychologically, emotionally, spiritually well. And as a team to be socially, socio-emotionally well and to operate well as leaders in the world. We knew that we needed to set very high standards and we called these gold medal standards. That wasn't a gold medal. It's not a gold medal. If you're focusing on the medal, that's what gets us into trouble. Um, if, it, if it's a medal at all costs, right? We will end up compromising other values, principles, and beliefs. So it must be standards of practice. So for us, it was a time, but it was also standards of behavior outside and beyond the water, outside of the athletic arena. We also wanted to be leaders, right? Tying all back to, we didn't want to compromise or, or uh, conduct ourselves in any way that was considered corrupt or cheating. We knew we'd have to operate to leverage our strengths as a cable, not a chain. In rowing in particular, but I would say in every sport endeavor, it is about alignment between those on the team. Whether you're an individual player surrounded by team um, supporters and practitioners, or you're a part of a team, uh, team sport like rugby or rowing or basketball, we knew that the strongest teams are aligned. They're very connected. They love each other, uh, aligned around a common purpose, like a cable, and um, yet distinct. Each, each thread is distinct. A chain hinges too much on the individual, and a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. We knew we needed to have much more, much more sustainability than that to endure the, the training that we'd set for ourselves, which was going to be extraordinary in order to go as fast as we need to go. We also were introduced to this concept, and I think it was a really crucial element that underpins how sport needs to operate going into the future. It's really where the biggest gap we have right now in our system is this lack of partnership. And a partnership, not patriarchal model or hierarchical model, is essential for any endeavor, I think, any organization, group, community, team to function well, there must be equity. And where we fall down in our world are these underlying assumptions and principles governing our society that need to be called out. They are flawed and they are destructive. That uh, colonialism, imperialism, paternalism, capitalism, um, and patriarchy are so dangerous. And if you, we examine the fundamental assumptions governing these concepts and governing our society right now, that's they are the root of uh, the destruction we're, we're facing right now, the divisiveness, the polarization, that we think we can be one person is more important than another, that one way of thinking is more important, than, that you have the right to take from others, that you have the right to dominate others, that you have somehow the right to make profit be be all and end all priority. Right? It's not true and it doesn't work. And we're seeing 
you know, we're reaping the benefits uh, and also the destructiveness of these kinds of mentalities and these paradigms. We need to shift. And finally, ethics, not optics. How we needed to really make a choice to do good, to be good, not just look good through and through. And so this commitment to cultural alignment, commitment to our values and beliefs, and really living that day to day, crucial. Uh, we couldn't, we weren't going to choose to just appear to be doing the right things. We wanted to actually be living them. And that is essential. That is cultural integrity right there, making the right choices. So what I'll do now is go into a little more detail for each of these. But first, I want to highlight that these six principles, they work. So we studied our team from the 90s. We had so much success and we uh, distilled those principles, among other things. But I'm just highlighting six today. Um, you'll see that this is the, the medal table from the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain um, and the 1991 World Championship. Sorry, this is a year before the, the Olympics, right? And so we actually met our goal a year early. And at the World Championships leading into the Olympics, this is what the medal table looked like. And you'll see that really not much has changed. Germany is still there. They're quite strong. And I would say, sure, the wall came down in 89 by 91 though there are still some East German bodies in these boats. They're still as giant as they were. Uh, we see Romania just as strong, lots of Romanian gold, uh, medals here. We see the Soviet Union and Russia getting much stronger. Now they have three, whereas they only had one last time. And, and China's kind of fallen off, Bulgaria's fallen off, but these other countries are incredibly strong still. And where's Canada? Well, Canada seemed to kind of or leap at all into almost a replication of the East German sweep in 88, where you see us in occupying many of the gold medal positions. We didn't enter these two uh, events, but in 1996 Olympics, Marnie McBean and Kathleen Heddle partnered up to win a gold in the double and a bronze in this quad. So we were definitely on a path and certainly on to something because it certainly did work. In the, uh, and then at the Olympics, we carried on and won all the events again. And the men won as well, the men's eight. Now you see a bronze here, and this was Silken Lauman up at the top in the single, and she was on track to win the gold at the 92 Olympics and then suffered a life-threatening injury in Essen in May of that year. In three months, she and her team galvanized, problem solved, and really kept the focus on competing at the Olympics. And she not only competed, but she still ended up securing herself a medal. It was amazing to watch and just what an amazing human being. Uh, but again, testament to the power of team and power of community and getting her there. So we actually think of that medal as platinum, you know, much, much more valuable than anything else. So eyes in your own boat, you know, in terms of sport, uh, I do often this exercise where I ask people to stand on one foot in balance and tell me what is it that actually helps you maintain your balance. And in rowing, it's very, very much a balanced sport like high kneel canoeing or kayaking would be. And at Rural Roads, we often talk about change, organizational, environmental change as whitewater. You know, we're constantly facing unpredictabilities, high pace, fast speed, you know, so much going on all the time. It's like whitewater. How do you navigate that? Well, if you focus on your balance, you realize what are the things that contribute to you being able to stay upright, stay balanced, stay centered. And people often say, well, focus is the first thing that comes to mind. When you stare at one thing, that kind of centers your whole body. So the power of focus, the power of your core strength, right? Just absolutely feeling strong enough to hold yourself intact. Um, the other one is the recovery, breathing and being relaxed, right? And they're all kind of intertwined. When you're focused and you have a strong core, you're much more able to relax and breathe. But remembering to recover is crucial, crucial in sport and crucial in leadership. And finally, if you do topple over, you know, having the strength of your core to be able to adapt, same in a kayak, right? But also support, you need that paddle. And in rowing, we have these long oars that give us the support. If we do need to touch the water, we can. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it slows you down for sure, but in the long run, it's probably much more sustainable. And we know that in organizational practice. So as a leader, you really, your job is really to 
um, ensure that we have the clarity of strategic direction. And you do that by facilitating, gathering input, right? making sure everybody agrees and has conviction in the strategic direction or mission or purpose of the organization. Um, you make sure that you are so giving people that focus that they believe in, right? So that they do feel it's very centering. And we work on our core, right? We work, we have to practice and develop it and strengthen. What are our core strengths? What are our core beliefs? What gives us, what nourishes us and gives us power and energy? And in organizations, we need to do the same thing. We know that. We know from Hersberg's research on motivation that people are most motivated when they have the opportunity to achieve, to progress, to demonstrate their knowledge and abilities and feel counted, right? Acknowledged and recognized for that. As much, that's your biggest lever in organizations as a leader is to create those opportunities for people. But that starts with them feeling committed and focused. Why is it so important to be so focused? Because without it, if you're not focused, if you're distracted, you're looking around, you're giving away all your energy, but you're also so unsettled. It's very difficult to stay upright, first of all. Very difficult to be able to focus on your work and to be able to do it well. If you're constantly distracted, worried, uncertain, unstable, if you're feeling destabilized and you see it, you know, we have um, an epidemics of anxiety and, and mental illness in our organizations because of that stress. So as a leader, you're trying to bring us back to center, make sure we have something we can focus on and feel, feel deep belief in, not just buy in. Um, I recall a, a race we had against the Russians and, and we were down off the start and there was a headwind and the Americans false started. So we kind of had this shaky start and we were in fifth place out of sixth. And all we could do, really, we knew it was focus on our race plan. We had built this race plan over many, many hours and days and honed it and refined it. And we had to make sure everybody believed in it. Um, you have to be quite brave in those race planning circles to put your hand up if a word wasn't going to work for you. You had to acknowledge it. So even though eight other women believed in it, you didn't, they'd all take a big sigh and say, okay, we got to find another word that works for all nine. Um, you'll see there are eight people in a boat and then the coxie that's steering the boat, right? So nine individuals. But this is a very crazy start to a race, right? You have, you've got six crews with eight rowers and the sound of the oarlocks and the sound of the water splashing, it's intense and all the coxies, every single one of these people are yelling their heads off. So it's really an intensely demanding and distracting environment. Well, the, the Russians were leading and we were in behind, but we just focused on a race plan, blocked out everything else. We knew it wasn't about the Russians. It wasn't about the metal. It was about executing our race plan, executing our optimal performance. And we knew that if we could do that, we would go fastest, the fastest. We would go faster than anybody else in the world. So we had to execute that race plan. And that's what we did. And guess what? We won by two centimeters. And I, I sometimes feel kind of bad for the Russians because they really should have won it. But they kept looking out at us. They gave us away their gave away their focus and gave it to us. Right. So focus is essential, and that's why strategic mission direction is so important and needs to be galvanizing. Needs to be something people actually can invest in, engage with, and uh, believe in. So that allows you to keep your eyes in your own boat. Allows you to perform with total confidence and um, and sense of purpose and relaxation as well you're not distracted you're not anxious you're not worried about anything because you have a deep conviction in what you're doing and how winning oh i wanted to also highlight you know this is where we're going off the rails with sport in canada right now our eyes are not in our own boat our eyes are on everything but they're on winning the medal they're on the Russians, you know, and, and that is completely distracting from our ultimate purpose and goal of sport. Sport is not for medals. That's not the reason for sport. It's for human and social development. We're developing these human beings. They're striving to be the best they can be physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. It's all consuming sport. Anybody who's done it knows, especially when you're trying to, to achieve ascend to the limits that these people are trying to break through, right? 
and it's for social development because when you're developing people so beautifully and holistically like that they are then leaders they can then come back into the community and you see it you know you see these fantastic athletes who become leaders uh, my teammate trisha smith she's a the president of the Canadian Olympic Committee. She's on the World Rowing Committee. She's on International Olympic Committee. She's an amazing lawyer. She's a brilliant leader. Uh, Marnie McBean was just um, was just nominated for the Senate. You know, now she's a senator and doing such great work uh, in all that she does across her uh, endeavors, helping sport organizations, but really informing and fighting for important causes. So eyes in your own boat. We're thinking about owning the podium or, or about medals are most important. We're privileging those. Sure, winning is great. And it is the point of the game. You want to try and be better. Um, but it's about being better, being the best, being your best. It isn't about winning something necessarily. So, and uh, we can't focus everything on a medal. We can't evaluate people against their medals. Because sometimes your best performance has nothing to do with a medal. Sometimes your best performance... We used to race uh, eight times in two days to get race experience. And so the learning was the point. And the best performance was the fact that we had learned so much over those eight races that we are now going to be even more prepared for our next performance, right? So there were no medals that weekend because we were exhausted, but it, that wasn't the point. It's about learning, human and social development. Winning well, not at all costs, was another key principle. The idea we wanted to be, we wanted to win well, morally, cleanly, truthfully, honestly, but also well, healthy, psychologically, emotionally, socially, physically, you know, in, remain intact as a team, um, remain intact as a human being, be a leader when you come off that field and, and out into a career post-sport. So this was also crucial to us and, um, and taught to us by our, our coach, you know, how important it was to monitor our health as well as. And of course, because if we're not healthy, we are unsustainable and we're not actually gonna be of any use to anybody. And that was part of that, um, the mentality we had to embrace. If we're going to tolerate three a day workouts and lifting weights four times a week and putting in 200 kilometers a week, we had to be well, we had to be recovering. So active recovery was part of that as well and weaving in, uh, recovery, allowing for that periodization and really committing to that, I'm not thinking you have to redline it the whole time. It's impossible. And of course, in organizations, we know this as well. We know how important it is to measure health and engagement and, you know, that we're emotionally healthy, but also physically and mentally healthy as well. And all of those require skills and they require education and support as a leader in your organization. You are responsible for making sure your workforce is healthy and that you are building, building your workforce, you know, that this process they're going through as part of your organization um, is actually nourishing to them. You're not, you're not um, depleting them over time and then casting them aside and getting new. You're supposed to be actually a fostering growth and development as well. Linda Duxbury does some great work on health in organizations and, and how to measure health in organizations. And we need to focus on this as well, equally. I would say in our sports system, it's exactly the same. We need to expand our evaluation criteria of sport organizations that are getting funding to include things like participation rates, health, mental, social, emotional, physical, and, and development. Are you... Um, is your sport actually producing leaders? Are we contributing to society in some way? In what ways? Capture that. It's really crucial. The idea of then gold medal standards. And I think often um, measurement is something we talk a lot about in organizations. We talk a lot about it in sport as well. And there are really easy measures. And often um, in a sport like rowing, it's a time, you know, or racing on a track. It's easy. Um, but there are lots of other measures, even in a sport that's based on time, there are other things we are capturing. And I always love the reference to Kyle Lowry, who was on the Raptors. Um, there's a great article written by him and how he contributed the 32 other things that aren't on the stat sheet. Right? So we might count assists and uh, points and charges that he took, but that's it on the stat sheet, right? And how many fouls you get. But there are other things and his teammates and his opponents pointed out what else he contributes. His, um, 
his leadership, his communication, facilitation, pointing out opportunities, keeping the morale up, whether he's on the bench or on the floor, um, the way that he was brave and demonstrated commitment by taking charges, um, by really going for it on certain plays and demonstrating this is what it's going to take, right, to elevate your performance. And that would then have the, a ripple effect across his teammates. The most important one I thought was when his, his um, the other point guard on his team, so, you know, they're competing for the same position on the team, really, pointed out how important Kyle Lowry was to their success and the, all the different ways that he contributed vocally and with his personality, with his calm demeanor, with his encouragement and support, all these different things he was contributing, along with his assists and his charges and his um, and his points that he was scoring in his, you know, it's so many things, right? And we have to get better in our organizations at measuring not just the bottom line, but all these other things that count. Ryan Essler talks about the caring economy and how with more nuanced measurement of, of more sort of sociological or what we call soft skills, but at Royal Roads, we call them hard skills, core skills, um, core skills, right? The, the centering, core kind of skills of facilitation, consultation, process management, including people in the process at Royal Roads, we have this wonderful tagline, life.changing, and it's so enduring, timeless. Everybody uses it. Everybody loves it. Everybody connects to it because it's what we really believe in and do. We foster life-changing experiences. We make you uncomfortable. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable, right? So that sort of galvanizing um, exercise and concept is worth measuring. It's really a measure of engagement, isn't it? And we need to be able to pay attention to those more core um, measurements of core skills, core concepts, and core elements of our organizations. Get creative. If you can talk about it, you can measure it. Um, oh, sorry, I keep skipping. Um, and, you know, this is where we're going off the rails in our sports system as well in Canada is that we're measuring only medals right now at the at the National Sport Organization, but even just right across the system. And we're forgetting about how important development is. You know, So where are we capturing and rewarding and resourcing and reinforcing development practice? Uh, things that foster and, and develop skills of yes, athletic skills, but also leadership and sociological skills. Where are we doing that? Where are we? Are we actually capturing it but also then resourcing it what are our gold medal standards of practice in our sports system and we have to go beyond we have to go beyond uh, the medals cables not chains i mentioned you know that chains are only as strong as their weakest link and we have to move beyond that individualistic we know how important diversity is we know how powerful teams can be when they move from just a coordinated group to something that's cooperative and they have shared understanding and then can collaborate and build something much bigger than themselves. And I often encourage people to do a, a little exercise where you take a pencil, one pencil, you can just snap it, no problem, right? But when you pull three pencils together and they're aligned, so held together tightly and also, you know, tightly connected, but also aligned, very difficult to break just three pencils. It doesn't seem like it would be that much more strong but it, it's exponentially strong and when you really think about well, why why is it so strong it's because of those interacting forces balancing both demand pressure and support okay? and when they interact it's an exponential creation of energy crucial to that is the fact that each pencil is unique and distinct right they're not just blending amorphously into one another um they're distinct and unique, right? There's your diversity, but there must be alignment. We must all agree to swim the same way, to wrap around and galvanize around a common purpose. That purpose has to speak to us. As a leader in an organization, that is probably your central job is facilitating that kind of believe in, that kind of conviction, um, that kind of connection to each other, like fostering environments where people can actually connect and learn more about one another creating processes where people will understand and arrive at, understand each other, but arrive at a shared understanding that takes time, energy, intentionality, and facilitation. That is the leader's job. 
creating those opportunities and environments, introducing those kinds of processes with intention and focus. You need to know what you're trying to actually create and you're trying to create cables. So yes, someone gets hit, sick, that's okay. We're resilient enough to, to endure illness, COVID, injury, um, life events that come up, right? We're resilient enough. And we had that in our team. We faced some very serious injuries and we were able to still perform at the same level because we had lots of resiliency, lots of backup, lots of people who exactly could flow right into that cable and, uh, and twine themselves with the rest. We love the cable too, because it's such a beautiful metaphor of our rhythm, like a whip, you know, um, and the rhythm was very much built on that winning well concept where lots of exertion and then lots of recovery. So almost a three to one ratio of exertion one and then three recovery to build. And so you can put in as much energy and guess what? The harder you push in rowing, the more time you then have to recover in between strokes. Powerful stuff. Partnership, not patriarchy. And, you know, sometimes I'm hesitant to call out patriarchy, but I've become much less so over the years. This idea that there is one dominant group of people within our society is, is crazy. And again, it completely contradicts the principles of diversity that we know are so essential to survival and to sustainability. So patriarchy, hierarchy, that there are somehow there's a there's someone that's more important than others or a way of thinking that's more important than others one element of your organization is somehow privileged over the others your organization cannot function without all of the pieces at uh, railroads i'm really proud of how we have these they're probably very expensive meetings but they're important meetings because they gain perspective from all who are stakeholders in a process. So if we're going to change a program, it's not just the professors and the staff who do that. We, we of course, talk to the enrollment, admissions, recruitment, marketing, communications, finance. We talk to everybody because it will have implications for everyone. It ripples out. And we respect that everyone is a stakeholder and partner in us designing something that's going to be excellent. And the, the athletes, the students and the alumni play a role in there too, right? So this idea of partnership was really central to our team and our team's success. Our, our coach would hammer it into us that he wasn't anything without us and we couldn't be anything without him. His role was to bring innovation, research, um, standards of practice, you know, our expertise was athletic, right? We were gifted physically, mentally, emotionally to be able to perform at that level. And the two together, wow, we were partners and aspiring to excellence. Our opponents were our partners too. And we would all work together to achieve excellence. We're pushing each other. One team gets the medal, but that other per that other team plays a, an essential role in, in achieving that outcome. I mean, it's a shared outcome. He also made us realize and understand and appreciate that we were no more important than anybody else. Just because you're an Olympian doesn't mean that you're more valuable than another individual in the world. Of course not, right? So again, just really respectful of the, the importance of diversity and our role within it and uh, how to respect that. Partnership was also crucial because what it built was psychological safety. So again, Amy Emmonson, Tim Clark, they talk about how we can only really learn, transform, grow, develop a learning organization, a team that, that in, in refines and improves um, when people are safe enough to challenge the system, to question and, and challenge our assumptions that are governing us and, and um, demand or expect something new, some kind of new in innovation, be willing to try something new, be open to trying something new, right? So without that, we will never get better. And without safety, people won't do that and you'll stagnate. And we see that in our sport organizations right now where they're just these very old fashioned uh, patriarchal structures that are going nowhere, that are stuck in status quo, protectionist, uh, and protecting their power and dominion, and it is unsustainable. There's a new world coming. Um, <clears throat> this idea of partnership 
was essential to the development of our team, to being open to innovation, uh, because we were safe to both try and fail, question and challenge, but also just be ourselves and express ourselves fully, our strengths, our quirks, any you know anything that might contribute to making that team a little faster, that boat a little faster. A partnership's essential. And uh, unfortunately, I think in our world, and we're seeing it within our sports system, that this is where we fall down. We're still so patriarchal, so full of fear. And there's still so much power over um, and dominance. And then people won't speak out. They won't challenge. We see it at the athlete or you know any participant who's been abused or reluctant to speak out, so afraid of the repercussions of being blacklisted, of being cut of being having their carding taken away we see it in terms of bystanding right where people are too afraid to call it what they're seeing because of the backlash they may experience um and there's this terrible hierarchy that is creating this environment or climate of fear that is not productive and we know through performance science that you know confidence is crucial and you can be um as our coach always said always respect your opponent but never fear them you know you're you're just like them and it's about understanding who they are respecting them and lining up beside believing that you can you can be just as fast or as strong etc yes and the solution of course within our sports system i think the problem and the solution are connected the problem is that we are lacking in independence uh, and we are therefore lacking in transparency, we're lacking in accountability, and uh, becoming these kind of insular bodies that are operating without a lot of oversight. And that's when we start to run into problems. We saw it with Hockey Canada, where maybe the initial thinking around a settlement, around settling the Graham James case, but then they started going down the slippery slope of, of more and more and more settlements to protect the organization, but the organization are the people. An organization isn't, it's an entity, but it's not a person. It is a group of individuals that are contributing. And so for Hockey Canada to use membership fees and um, public money, federal money, in order to, to settle sexual assault claims is, is just unheard of, right? It's something that we just can't tolerate, but somehow we, those in power convince themselves that it's for the good of the organization. No, it isn't. And we need to make sure that we're really clear. What can prevent that, though, uh, from happening, that slippery slope, is greater independence, separating out, creating very, very clear roles and, and, um, and responsibilities of oversight, but also then demanding to see that that oversight is occurring. So Sport Canada has their governance code right now, but it's just a little checklist. You need an actual process to ensure that sport boards are enacting their uh, roles and responsibilities of oversight of the organization, that there is an accountability framework in place, that there is transparent communication of that accountability framework. Um, the minutes are always posted. The financial books are always out there, but all of that needs to be, be available uh, in order to create that sense of accountability and um, and trust. We are really struggling with these three things, accountability, independence, and uh, transparency in our sports system right now. And a lot of it has to do with, I think, mm, sport is, it is different. It is not for profit. It's not charitable, but it is about social contributions and development. And uh, we need a body that's able to ensure that accountability is happening at, at every level of sport, whether it's grassroots to the national team. Um, we need to ensure that's there. And right now, I, it isn't. And so we're running into all sorts of problems. I think it also starts with the fact, this misunderstanding of what a leader really is and the role that they hold. I love this quote from Richie McCaw. He's, was captain of the New Zealand All Black 15s team. So 15 guys on a field. And his quote is like, the team consists of a captain, but also 15 leaders. Everybody's a leader. The captain holds a specific role and responsibility, but they're not more important than, and they're not any more of a leader than, but it's just a unique form of leadership that has to usually do with communication, 
coordination facilitation, but we should not privilege them. And I think Rogi does a very good job of this, where they're, it's not necessarily all about the rookies and the veterans. You know, everybody, especially the, you know, the book about the legacy book about all blacks talks about everyone cleans a shed, right? It's everybody's responsibility. They're taking a very strong stance around concussion and injury. And they're taking a very strong stance against abuse toward officials. They're taking one of the strongest stances of any sport organizations in the world. So really incredible. And some people find contradictory because it seems like such a violent sport, but it, it is no more violent or physical or contact than basketball. You know, you're using your body to position and move people around, but, um, but or, or hits in hockey, as long as they're legal and as long as you're constantly thinking about your opponent and their health as well, you know, you don't want to knock them out because then you've kind of given an imbalance in power on the, uh, on the field. Right. So power balance is crucial in sport as it is in any organization. Uh, Joyce Fletcher talks about, we need to get rid of this heroic leadership model. It is not the way to go. It just creates false hierarchies, false, colonialism, false imperialism, a mindset of domination and power over, which is not productive. It's disengaging. It, when you take people's sense of power away, it, it simply diminishes them. So yes, you may be the captain, but it means you, you play a specific role on the field. If you're not there, the team is still going to perform very well. If we remove the president of the university, we remove the VPs of an organization or CEO, that it's still going to run. Everybody knows what they're doing. That leader then, their responsibility is to bring value to the field, right? They bring the innovation, the research, the partnerships. They And then they ensure, because they know leadership is about facilitating, coordinating, creating environments and opportunities, spaces and processes to galvanize the, the organization. I have a friend who coaches soccer. She says, if you're not giving, you're taking. And so what are you giving as a leader? What are you bringing that's extra because of this extra role you hold or this unique role you hold? It's not necessarily on top of anything else, but it is uh, a unique role. Make it worthwhile and value added. And finally, ethics, not optics. And we see, I'll go backwards with this one, a real problem in our sports system right now with organizations choosing the optics over the ethics. We'll make it look good. We make it look like everything's fine, as long as it looks okay. Um, let's sweep that under the butt. Let's get rid of that so no one sees it anymore. Let's diffuse this scandal over here with an announcement that the, the NHL players are gonna be playing in the Olympics. You know, the timing of that is incredibly suspect and it is designed to obfuscate the negative and bring in just a lot of shininess and happiness, right? But it does nothing to solve the actual problem, to heal from the scandals and, and criminal uh, acts, to heal from the abuse that's been inflicted. It's no different than truth and reconciliation. We're full circle. Are we choosing optics or are we choosing ethics? Are we actually taking responsibility? And I've seen many examples of leaders. We see lots of cases of this, you know, um, the maple leaf when they had the tainted meat. We had a local store here on the Vancouver Island in Victoria called Thrifties. And they were renowned for their immediate response was to clear their shelves of all meat. Just get rid of it all immediately. Because what's their mission? What's their purpose? They feed people. Right? They feed people. And so are you going to feed them tainted meat? Are you going to risk the food that you're giving to people that you're going to feed them? So no risk, right? Get rid of all of it. And we'll talk about it later and we'll figure out what to do next. But we're first and foremost is the safety of our customers um, and that we're making sure we're giving them good quality food as we feed people, right? Brilliant. And you see other organizations choosing to just make it look good, make it look okay, make it look like we're doing something, but we're actually not. You know, we're picking through and trying to choose to save ourselves money. And we think we're protecting the organization and doing so, but you're not. You're risking not only losing people to death and all those lawsuits that will follow, but you're risking losing reputation, relationship, trust. All of that is a foundation for performance because not only your customers, but the people who work for you, if they don't have that sense of 
trust and psychological safety. Remember, they're not going to perform because they won't be able to focus. And they're certainly not going to believe in what you're doing. So we won't have that galvanizing effect of everybody going the same direction. Right? So ethics, not optics. When you do make a mistake, the opportunity to demonstrate your integrity and to build trust is huge. I think often leaders don't quite understand that it is an opportunity. Again, Amy Emerson writes about failure in fearless organizations and how important it is for leaders to recognize their mistakes as opportunity to demonstrate how you're gonna manage that, to demonstrate integrity, right? really step up as a leader and take it on and take responsibility. We're seeing a total lack of responsibility in sport lately with organizational leaders who are who are uh, vicariously liable, who are complicit in some of these cases of abuse, but are choosing optics over ethics, who are choosing to uh, distance themselves or turn away or sweep that under the carpet or ignore or deny, instead of saying, wow, there is something very wrong in the state of Denmark right now, and we are committed to examining it, understanding it, fixing it, and we will constantly communicate to you what we've done to make things better. Again, I have to celebrate my, my teammate and, and colleague, Tricia Smith, for what she did with the COC when they faced a scandal around their former president, Marcelo Bu, and was so incredibly transparent, immediately apologized, immediately solicited the support of uh, an independent reviewer to examine their organization, figure out where things were wrong, broken, off the rails, and fix it and took total responsibility for doing so. There's a whole website that's still up that shares everything they did, what they learned, uh, the terms of reference for the review, everything's there, visible. What we need to be doing in sport is making those things transparent. Hockey Canada got their uh, federal funding back. How, according to what criteria and what? how do we know they met that criteria? That should be publicly available because it's public money that's funding these organizations. Now, one could argue, well, they have sponsors as well, and those are stakeholders, and they have their own contract, and they have levers as well, and demands and criteria, and those should be made public to them, should be transparent to that, uh, to that partnership. But when we're talking about the members and the public in Canada, we also are big stakeholders. In fact, we are the organization of Hockey Canada um, and should be seeing these criteria and evidence, that's good governance, evidence that they're meeting these criteria uh, published daily. So ethics, not optics. It's all about uh, being good, not just looking good. And we do that through demonstrating, demonstrating that we're following the rules and criteria we should be. So I hope those six uh, principles were, were of use to you. I am happy to discuss further, reach out any time. Uh, and I like to finish with this idea of, you know, come on across my bridge for sure, but also to, to join us, to join us community, you know, here at Row Rose, but also there are so many groups and communities of practice working on this concept of leadership in organizations and leadership in sport to get involved because we need to get wired for a new world. There is a new world coming. We're seeing the, uh, the, the exponential advancement of gender equity, of questioning of the colonial capitalistic mindsets that govern sport right now, uh, questioning this concept of profit is priority or medals are all that matter. We need to evolve as a society and we need to um, understand the power sport actually offers our society and it needs to evolve with us so that we are actually leveraging the promise of sport human and social development thank you so much and we will see you again soon i hope we will probably uh be having another yes we will be having another webinar on the 21st and then we'll be having our final webinar in this series is that right maybe there's two more another one oh yeah another one in march um march 14th and then april 4th is our final in the suite around culture in sporting canada thank you so much for your attention and i'll see you next